we get down to business. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the most disturbing, terrifying, or otherwise creepy moments from the original Twilight Zone series. Consider this a spoiler alert. Well, it doesn't make very much difference because sooner or later, will all of us be on the menu? Number 20, The Empty Town, Stopover in a Quiet Town. Some of the creepiest moments from the original Twilight Zone aren't always the loud, crazy reveals, but those tense and pensive scenes of confusion and foreshadowing. This was seen in episodes like Where Is Everybody, as well as in 1964's Stopover in a Quiet Town. There's an uncanniness to the fake materials present within the strange town that Millie and Bobby Fraser wake up in after a night of drinking. Hey, nice baby. Hey, sweetheart. The couple can recall a strange shadow appearing over their car the night before, but the desolation of the town and the distant echoing sound of a child's laughter nearly drives them to madness. We're being watched. No. Now you're getting delusions. <laughs> Was that a delusion? It isn't until the final frightening reveal that it all begins to make sense. <laughs> Number 19, The Jack in the Box, It's a Good Life. It's a Good Life is one of the most famous episodes from the show's original run, and it was even included as a segment in 1983's Twilight Zone the movie. However, while that adaptation benefited from its outlandish special effects, the OG reveal of the Jack in the Box doesn't take a backseat to anyone. Would somebody take a lamp or a bottle or something and end this? You're a bad man. We don't need to necessarily see the entire transformation, as our minds automatically go to how grotesque a human slash toy hybrid would probably appear. <laughs> It's a Good Life shoots actor Don Kiefer in close-up, while the shadow of a jack-in-the-box is projected on the wall. The cast's reactions pretty much say it all. Anthony Fremont, a young child with the powers of a god, punished a very bad man. And you mustn't think bad thoughts about me either, or I'll do the same thing to you. <laughs> Number 18, Anne calls to her past self, spur of the moment. If we could somehow contact our younger selves and warn that person to not make a dreadful, life-altering mistake, would we do it? Could we do it? And if so, would it work? <laughs> 1964's Spur of the Moment attempts to present such a situation, albeit with a bummer twist ending only possible in the Twilight Zone. <laughs> The image of a desperate woman in black chasing a younger woman on horseback is initially played for intensity and fright. I think if she caught me, she would have killed me. What? Anne! Oh God, the way she looked at me! However, it's later revealed that both women riders were one and the same. 43-year-old Anne Mitchell is desperately trying to warn her 18-year-old self not to marry the wrong man. A man that will ruin her life. Oh, David, you are my true love, my adored one. Make me happy. Please make me oh, happy. I will. I'm... Tragically, her words go unheard. Today may change tomorrow, but once today is gone, tomorrow can only look back in sorrow that the warning was ignored. Number 17. The aliens are earthlings, the invaders. Agnes Moorhead gives a tour de force performance in this 1961 episode of The Twilight Zone, titled The Invaders. It's all about physical reactions and facial expressions, as the episode reaches its final climax and twist. Central Control! Come in, Central Control! Do you read me? Gresham is dead! Moorhead's character seems to be tormented by tiny yet resilient assailants, and the episode makes it clear from the jump that we're dealing with extraterrestrials. However, the true invaders are actually Earthlings, and the flying saucer shown near the episode's opening is revealed to be from the United States. This subversion of expectation, making Moorhead's character essentially a giant from outer space, gets us every single time.
Number 16, Martians and Venusians and the Third Eye. Will the real Martian please stand up? You just gotta love that double twist. Will the real Martian Please Stand Up plays its creative hand by seemingly commenting on the suspicion and paranoia that was present during American McCarthyism. Which one of you wasn't on the bus? We were all on the bus. However, it does this by asking a question. Which one in this otherwise innocuous diner happens to be an alien? Well, the twist is that there are two aliens. What difference does it make who was on the bus and who wasn't, or whether there were six or seven or 120? Is this a diner or a Gestapo headquarters? Fine, I take it easy, mister. One with three arms is revealed to be serving as a scout, reporting back to Mars for an upcoming invasion of Earth. What are you, some kind of magician? <laughs> Who, me? Oh, hardly. However, the diner's cook is then revealed to be from Venus, and he is quick to point out to the Martian that... We folks on Venus had the same idea. We got it several years ago. Oh, and he reveals a very creepy third eye, just to hammer that point home. And if you're still alive, I think you'll see how we differ. Number 15, there was time now, time enough at last. Shelley, Shakespeare, Shaw, all the books I want. There are a number of quotes from The Twilight Zone that seem to be intrinsically linked with the show's cultural legacy. Burgess Meredith's Henry Bemis utters one such quote at the end of the 1959 episode, Time Enough at Last. The real creepiness behind Bemis' situation, and Meredith's line delivery, is the pure despair in his voice. You, Mr. Bemis, do not function within the organization. You are neither an efficient bank teller nor a proficient employee. You, Mr. Bemis, are a reader. A, a reader? Bemis was already pushed around by most of those in his life prior to the nuclear weapon that annihilates the country. An earlier scene also showcased the extent of Bemis' despair, as he contemplated taking his own life. So when Henry cries out there was time now after breaking his glasses, we truly feel every ounce of fight leaving his body. And it's bone-shelling. That's not fair at all. There was time now. Number 14, it's a cookbook to serve man. The closing twist to 1962's To Serve Man may seem a little on the nose now, but it's important to admire the context with which this line was written. America in the early 1960s was eagerly anticipating interstellar travel. The 1969 moon landing was still years away, and there was a lot of uncertainty as to who or what lay out there among the stars. We come from a planet far beyond this galaxy, a planet far more developed than Earth, but we come as friends. As a result, various theories emerged about how aliens might contact us. To serve man lets us have our proverbial cake and eat it too, as it initially presents an alien race as humankind's saviors. To serve man. I hope so. I fervently hope so. Yet when the alien's book, To Serve Man, is translated, their true intentions become disturbingly clear. They are more focused on deciding who's for dinner. Don't get on that ship! The rest of the book, To Serve Man, it's... it's a cookbook! Number 13, the normal faces are revealed. Eye of the Beholder. The Twilight Zone stood out not just for its great writing, but also for the inventive special effects and remarkable makeup for its day. What's the matter with you all? While episodes such as The Masks featured some eerie makeup for its cast, perhaps none of them had the same shocking impact as those used for 1960's Eye of the Beholder. It's hopeless, isn't it, Doctor? I'll never look in the me. Well, that's hard to say. It was this episode that traumatized an entire generation of children as it unveiled the normal faces of doctors who had attempted plastic surgery on a patient. Turn on the light. The reveal of beautiful Donna Douglas as the hideous Janet Tyler makes sense when we see her surgeons. Their porcine features and sloping brows still haunt our nightmares to this day. Number 12, Room for One, 22. There are a number of reasons why this episode of The Twilight Zone feels so unsettling. 
For starters, it was shot on video, which gave it an otherworldly quality. Room for one more, honey. Beyond this, however, the episode plays within a creative sandbox similar to the Final Destination franchise, in that its lead has ill-fated premonitions. They aren't dreams. They happen. Yeah. Just like I say they happen. I know, kitten, I know. Specifically, Liz Powell sees a very creepy nurse in a very creepy hospital that says a very creepy thing. And yes, it's in a very creepy way, too as the line, room for one more, honey, takes on a new meaning at the episode's climax. Room for one more, honey. <laughs> it turns out Liz Powell's real danger lay not in a hospital morgue, but on the doomed plane trip that was Flight 22. Number 11, Millicent's Reflection Speaks, Mirror Image. What happens when the mirror looks back? The episode Mirror Image uses this idea to profoundly creepy effect, as star Vera Miles begins to think her reflection is stalking her and trying to take her place in the world. Mirror Image achieves its creep factor slowly, via the misplacement of Millicent Barnes' luggage and disturbing shots of her reflection as she leaves a women's restroom. It all comes to a head near the end, however, when a fellow passenger at the bus stop where Millicent is waiting sees his own reflection in the flesh and attempts to chase him down. Number 10, The Statue People, Elegy. Death is an eternal mystery, and the notion of it is usually creepy enough for the average person. Elegy takes this notion one step further, using a sci-fi setting to set up a galactic graveyard full of stoic corpses, frozen in what seems to be moments of eternal joy. It seems comforting at first, but the three astronauts who land in this cemetery are more confused than anything, until they run into the cemetery caretaker, Jeremy Wickwire. To peace, my friends. To everlasting, eternal peace. The trio is tricked by Wickwire into drinking eternifying fluid, after which all three astronauts join the planet's silent statues, forever locked in this panorama of the deceased. Number 9, The Scenario. Midnight Sun. There's a palpable sense of panic and fear brought to the table by the Midnight Sun. I heard on the radio that they're only going to turn the water on an hour a day from now on. The last two neighbors in an apartment complex are brought together when the Earth detaches from its orbit and begins moving closer to the sun. The episode remains in the apartment complex for its duration, and there's a sense of horrible claustrophobia as the pair not only fends off their own fears of death, but also the more immediate threat of looting and violence outside. Combine this with a downbeat twist ending, and you have a Twilight Zone episode that still instills fear remarkably well, even decades later. That's such a terrible dream. So hot. Number 8. A Parent's Worst Nightmare – Little Girl Lost Picture it. You're a parent, and you wake up in the middle of the night to screams from your frightened daughter. All right, sweetheart, I'm coming. That situation alone is troubling enough, but add to it the fact that the child in Little Girl Lost seems nowhere to be found, and you have a parent's absolute worst nightmare. Although this Twilight Zone episode does have a happy ending, the early scenes featuring the disembodied pleas of a girl lost in a parallel dimension are beyond creepy. <laughs> Chris, where is she? I don't know and help start the episode off at maximum tension. Number 7. The Mannequins – The After Hours If you suffer from pediophobia, don't watch The After Hours alone. Actually, you might not want to watch it at all, as it just so happens to be one of the creepiest installments in the entire series run. You remember, Marsha. Climb off it. Come on, dear. Marsha. Shots of emotionless mannequin heads and scary faceless voices punctuate the tale of a young woman who forgets she's actually part of the decor at the department store where she's shopping. In this episode's universe, mannequins are allowed one month out of the year to be human, but for some reason, Anne Francis's character needs to be reminded, by being frightened out of her wits, of course. <laughs> Number 6. The Nightmares – Perchance to Dream Was this an influence for A Nightmare on Elm Street? Perhaps. Perchance to Dream features Richard Conte as a sleepless man who's terrified that his nightmares are out to get him. Conte hasn't slept in days, 
because when he does, he's tormented by a creepy funhouse. It's the kind of place you see only in nightmares. Everything warped and twisted out of shape. The nightmares also feature a seductive woman named Maya, and when he sees Maya's face in the real world, he jumps out of his psychiatrist's window in sheer panic. It's not until the end that we see he's actually never left the doctor's couch and died in his sleep. Well, I guess there are worse ways to go. At least he died peacefully. Number five, the ending. The monsters are due on Maple Street. The specter of McCarthyism looms large yet again in another episode of The Twilight Zone, this time with the monsters are due on Maple Street. <laughs> Paranoia and finger-pointing eventually devolve into complete chaos as relationships are smashed within a local neighborhood almost overnight. Who are them? Whoever was in that thing that came by overhead. What? Whoever was in the thing that came over. I don't think they want us to leave here. In fact, it's the speed with which this violent escalation takes place that ties into the episode's ending. It's Tommy! He's the one! Oh, that's not true! In a shocking twist, it becomes clear that aliens had been manipulating the town's fear and anger this whole time. Their sinister plan? To replicate this turmoil in one neighborhood after another, and another, and another, all on their way to total world domination. They pick the most dangerous enemy they can find, and it's themselves. All we need to do is sit back and watch. Number four, calls from beyond the grave, Night Call. Night Call follows a series of scary late night phone calls to a wheelchair bound woman named Elva. A moaning voice on the line is disturbing enough, but when Elva learns that the calls have been coming from the cemetery, there's no dialing back the creepiness. The mystery man does eventually stop calling, but the tragic twist is that the calls have actually been coming from Elva's deceased fiance, who died years ago from the same car accident that put Elva in her chair. Brian, are you there? Brian? Brian, if you're there, speak to me. Finally realizing this, Elva can only mourn her lost opportunity at speaking with her beloved one last time, adding a tinge of sadness to the terror. You said leave you alone. I always do what you say. Number three, seeing the gremlin, nightmare at 20,000 feet. Sure, the gremlin costume in this Twilight Zone episode may seem dated now, but it absolutely terrified audiences when it first aired in 1963. Nightmare at 20,000 Feet is successful because of its near-perfect pacing, as it teases the gremlin as a product of William Shatner's fractured mental state. He sees it attempting to sabotage the plane, but no one believes him. And the gremlin's behavior on the wing is both humorous and disturbing. There's a man out there! Keep your voice down. This episode received many accolades from fans, and it's easy to see why as Shatner's unhinged performance and the gremlin's still creepy design make Nightmare at 20,000 Feet a timeless classic. Number two, the mysterious figure, The Hitchhiker. The Hitchhiker is often cited as one of the series' classic episodes, and with good reason. This one is an all-out creep fest. No matter how far I travel or how fast I go, he's ahead of me. The dread is palpable, as the episode's protagonist becomes increasingly panicked and paranoid about an old hitchhiker who appears all along her cross-country drive. Inger Stevens is brilliant in the role of Nan, while the titular hitchhiker delivers the scares, often appearing out of nowhere, jumping into frame with a sad, blank look on his face. Things get sadder still when we realize that Nan has actually been dead all along. That's nothing the matter with my mother. What do you mean a nervous breakdown? Well, it's all taken place since the death of her daughter. It is suspenseful, disturbing stuff. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number one, I'm going to kill you, Taki Tina, Living Doll. The OG of deadly doll nightmare fuel, 
Talkie Tina was giving audiences the creeps way back in 1963. My name is Talkie Tina, and I love you very much. Tina basically gives us the shivers from the first moment she appears, first as a loving doll to young Christy, then as the bane of her stepfather's existence. You are going to be sorry. Tina taunts and threatens him incessantly with a malevolent deadpan delivery, as he tries in vain to destroy the doll and get it out of the house. Finally, he trips over the doll and falls down the stairs to his death, where he's discovered by his wife. Tina's final words? My name is Talkie Tina. And you'd better be nice to me. What Twilight Zone moments get under your skin? Let us know in the comments. Did you enjoy this video? Check out these other clips from WatchMojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.